time everybody should be more conscious about optimizing their health from once we hit 30. At these ages, when they cross link to collagen or protein in the skin, we develop wrinkles. I think that is an indirect way to say that maybe you're aging faster than you are. Because in our body, there are certain protective genes which are meant for longevity. Now people think about Fox or family, people think about Sartoids. So these genes are activate only when we are maintaining our blood glucose levels well, we are sleeping well, we are exercising well. So when the telomere ends shorten. Mm -hmm. The more they shorten, the quickly they shorten, faster we age. Longevity India Podcast, where future centenarians are inspired. Longevity India Podcast is sponsored by Decode Age. Decode Age is India's first longevity research company, which brings proven, trusted, and safe longevity supplements and a most advanced microbiome test to slow down and reverse aging process. Hello, Dr. Samantatullah. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. So uh, you do uh, age management, you provide age management as a service and this age management or we call it as healthy aging or we call it as functional medicine practitioner. I find it very intriguing that you don't treat the symptoms but you treat the root cause of a disease. Yes. And so what are your views? as a doctor on this approach, this transition from being patients to customer to yes. deal with disease before it's happening. So as you wisely said, I, uh, I transformed a client to a patient to a client, right? I was myself, uh, I didn't call myself a patient but three years back when I just finished by my MD internal medicine, I had few symptoms of my own headaches and all sorts of things. Then I was wondering, uh, in to which disease should I put these symptoms into? Me being a MD till medicine practitioner during that time, I found out certain things were not going well with my diet and lifestyle. That is how I discovered the root cause analysis or preventive medicine or functional medicine, precision medicine. People use different names to it. But thing is, there are certain minor things which happen in, in our bodies day to day. Mm. But we can't say that we fall into a particular disease. We have all these non-specific symptoms that happens when there is an imbalance in different uh, systems that we have. It could be immunological or gut health or it could be a uh, balance between oxidants and antioxidants. Something is going wrong somewhere that is how you uh, land up with certain non-specific symptoms and imbalance happens. This is what is, it is. Um, so when we talk about age management, this is nothing new. It has been there since some time. There's a Chinese proverb which if uh, you have heard of it, it says uh, inferior physician treats when the disease sets in and a mediocre physician treats when he starts to just notice the symptoms but a superior physician prevents the disease from even setting in or even delays, de delays the onset of the disease that is what a Chinese proverb was and there is a concept of family physician since long time uh, back where people look into very closely the, into their family symptoms and histories and that's how they try to prevent certain diseases when they see certain diseases run in the family or what is going wrong in terms of the diet or lifestyle. That is what I'm doing now, concentrating more on diet and lifestyle and try to, try to balance things. It could be balancing hormones, it could be balancing their uh, meals in a way that their glucose variability is not too high. Um, that we'll talk further as we go down the line or it could be even uh, finding ways to de-stress themselves or including more of breathing techniques that they're all missing or people are being more sedentary nowadays due to the different corporate work styles that we adopt to. So balancing all these things in a sense creates, puts them in a path to their optimum health I would say. So that is how we can put them give add, add more years to their healthy aging that is how we can prevent all these health disease, uh, age-related diseases, I would say. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing must be like, uh, someone should understand this, mm. that this root causes are what uh, resulting into disease and if I work on root causes, then I will be healthy. Yes. So once that realization happens, then how should a person start his or her journey for this age management? I think in today's time, everybody should be more conscious about optimizing their health from once we hit 30, I think, in today's time. Because post-pandemic, we have seen so many clients 
um, either they must have put on weight or they had high triglycerides, uh, irrational uh, blood, uh, blood glucose levels or some people have landed up in pre-diabetes. So all these things have happened when people have been more sedentary. Uh, luckily there was decreased stress, that's why there were less cardiac diseases or less uh, acute cardiac incidents that have happened during the time of pandemic when we were restricted to homes. We have not seen many acute cardiac incidents during that time if you have noticed. Because people are more de-stressed, more uh, with families, more trying to do other, other things apart from work as well. But now times have again changed. Uh, but if you look at it, after we hit 30, I think we should concentrate on both our lifestyle choices, the diet choices, the exercise and how to de-stress the base. And yeah, sleep is also a particular concern. I think after 30, we should also concentrate on sleeping well. Agreed. Now, you are uh, an expert on diabetes, to treat diabetes, so let's talk about it. Okay. I mean, uh, it's, it's a fact that glucose is bad for you. I mean, sugary foods are bad for you. Everybody accepts it. There is no controversy related to it. So, but uh, I feel that just saying that glucose is bad for you will not convince people. Yes. So, we need to talk about how actually it is bad for you. Yes. So, starting that conversation, the first thing that I want to ask you is, what does glucose actually do? Why do we need it? Okay. Um, now many people are talking about longevity, many people are talking about staying away from simple sugars or t um, sugary foods or refined foods, right? There's a reason behind why we do that and there are certain mechanisms which are associated with improving healthy aging, improving longevity and how these high blood sugar levels are causing a concern in today's time. Let me put it this way, we have heard about something called advanced glycation and products, short form is ages. So, if we eat food in a way that it is causing continuous spikes and troughs in our glucose levels in the body or we are eating foods in a way that our post meal blood glucose is spiked every time. A lot of research and articles are showing that these spikes, continuous spikes in the post meal blood glucose levels or continuous spikes and troughs in the blood glucose patterns are increasing these advanced glycation end products. So this is, there's a process called glycation where this excess glucose will not sit quiet. This long term chronic excess glucose in the blood goes and binds to proteins, uh, fats and even DNA and causes this products called ages. So these way ages are very active in the blood. They pile up over time. As over time your blood glucose has been high or your post meal glucose has been high, these ages pile up. And they affect these proteins that they are bound to in a certain way that there is a pro process called cross-linking. It cross-links, suppose there is a cross-linking happening in the skin. So collagen is very important for elasticity of the skin, right? So these ages, when they cross-link to collagen or protein in the skin, we develop wrinkles. I think that is an indirect way to say that maybe you are aging faster than you are. If we see a lot of wrinkles in a person who is just 30s or 40s, we say, you are looking old. It's not that they're just looking old, it's that they're aging faster. So one way is because we are harboring a lot of ages mm -hmm. because of the chronic high blood glucose levels. And this cross-linking is not just happening in the skin, not just wrinkles. We are also losing elasticity of the blood vessels. Suppose these ages go and accumulate in the blood vessels, we develop hypertension, we develop something called endothelial dysfunction. We are at a risk for cardiovascular diseases. So that is how early aging is linked to diabetes high um, cholesterol, stroke, uh, or even high blood pressure, even uh, heart attacks, cardiac uh, um, causes. So that is how ages or production of advanced glycation end product is affecting almost every condition in the body and that is how we are developing every other problems. After diabetes, we are at risk for cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, all sorts of things. So this is one sort of mechanism. The second thing which is happening is in our body there are certain protective genes which are meant for longevity. Now people think about Foxo family, people think about sirtuins and we also have something called telomerase, reverse transcriptase and such. So there are certain protective genes in the uh, body that body is meant to activate them only if you are in a good condition. Um, suppose um, 
we are exposed to a lot of pesticides or we are exposed to radiation, we are exposed to toxic metals or uh, heavy metals in the body, in the water, whatever. These multiple things lead to deactivation of these genes. So these genes are activate only when we are maintaining our blood glucose levels well, we are sleeping well, we are exercising well. So that is when these genes get activated. So as we age, our cells divide, our DNA divide. Our DNA has got protective caps called telomeres. So as we divide, 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 these cells divide, the telomere ends shorten. Mm -hmm. The more they shorten, the quickly they shorten, faster we age. If we don't put through our body through these toxic harmful methods or we are not exposed to alcohol, smoking or we are eating very balanced meals and doing all these things, we are able to save these telomeres for longer. We are able to activate these genes. So that way we are able to even have good energy houses, uh, good mitochondria in our cells, productive mitochondria. Mitochondria are powerhouse of the cell is what we are for. But if we have oxidative stress in the body, in the, in the way that we are either intoxicated with harmful chemicals or toxins around us, radiation or we are smoking, we are eating high sugary foods or we are eating more refined foods, these oxidative stresses increase and even antioxidants which are naturally there in the defense system which is there is deactivated. Mm -hmm. So that is how these longevity genes are not stimulated. Mm -hmm. So we better use up these longevity genes by maintaining all these things so that these particular uh, things are activated and we can um, age well or we can either push these age related diseases as far as possible. This is one other mechanism. And um, there is also a lot of research which shows this if we have high glucose levels for long term by eating this sugary Suppose there are certain people who do not end their meal without sugars or they are used to eating very refined foods either due to their work pattern or their meals not cooked at home, all sorts of things. These people, uh, they uh, usually the cell always has a balance. Cells as a pro part of mechanism, it produces byproducts which are oxidants and we also have an antioxidant system which runs very actively. This balance is lost sometimes when we eat a lot of these high GI foods. This balance is lost and this oxidative stress, what is it causing to the body? It releases a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. There was this very interesting study, about 10 lean students were taken, very lean active students. They were given 50 grams of carbs as direct sugar or refined foods. And immediately after the meals, NFKB, which is a pro-inflammatory marker in the body, was tested, which was very high. Which shows that even non-diabetic individuals who eat high glycemic foods can stimulate their inflammatory processes. Uh, this is fine if it is happening once in a while, but what if this pattern is happening very occasionally? You're putting your body into inflammatory state. That is why we say whenever they have any autoimmune conditions or diabetes or inflammatory condition, first thing we ask them is to get rid of these uh, refined foods or direct sugars, that is what we say. So um, people think I'm healthy, I'm active, I'm lean, I can eat um, high sugars all the time, but that is not true. Every time you're eating high sugars, you need to remember you're also stimulating these inflammatory markers every time you eat them. So that is one way to put it. Another way is DNA damage. So sugar is one such molecule which can directly cause damage to DNA by these particular mechanisms that we have talked about by stimulating this oxidant, stimulating inflammation of the body. And these also cause direct and we have our blood vessels are protectively lined by endothelium, which is a thin layer which protects keeps the blood um, protective, uh, it prevents clotting, it keeps blood pressure in control, it even uh, protects harmful chemicals from reaching into the bloodstream. So endothelium has got so important functions. But these high sugars uh, or frequent spikes in sugars have shown that this endothelium damage or dysfunction happens very early in the disease. That is why we see diabetics if they are not controlling the blood glucose very well in the beginning of the disease, they land up with eye conditions or retinopathy, nephropathy very early in the 
disease or develop blood pressure very early in their disease so this is one of the mechanisms these are the very uh, few types of mechanisms that happen in the body why sugar can cause all these very diseases and symptoms in us so like is there in term like good sugar bad sugar natural sugar synthetic sugar we I'm, have i just want to understand if sugar cane juice is good or bad for me because for me it's like it's natural so it yes. should be good yeah there are different forms of sugars not all sugar is bad we can't keep ourselves from we can't fast all the time yeah. we need carbs people think going uh, carb free is good but that is not so we should not go low carb we should go slow carb slow carbs are whole grains mm-hmm. slow carbs are rooted root veg, uh, vegetables rooted vegetables these we should have carbs are good in a way that we need uh, to make hormones we need to make collagen we need to produce energy we need to keep our system running but there's a balance we need a balance between protein carb and fats we need good fats healthy fats also to maintain our skin collagen our bones joints everything so people think going low carb is the way but not low carb i would say it's slow carb whole grains is important and even carbs are there in vegetables and fruits as well so here is what it is when we take, uh, say sugars we always mean refined foods processed foods table sugar these are bad for health and even high fructose corn syrup these are bad it's not that fruits are bad for you fruits are good but when you are a diabetic when your blood sh- glucose levels are very high your hbnc is very high you should make a smart choice till your blood glucose comes under control you choose low gi foods compared to high gi foods what is gi gi is the glycemic index where uh, that is a number given to every food when we have particular food our blood glucose spikes in particular way suppose when we eat white rice it spikes more and we have gi as more than 55 when we eat red rice or bl- black rice our glycemic index is less than 55 so how much does your sugar spike after eating certain kind of food gives its glycemic index gi so the smart way for all of us to do it is to choose low gi foods eat them most times of the week eat medium gi foods three at least three to four times a week and if you're eating high gi foods i save it for specific um <laughs> events in your uh, week or uh, have it once a week if you're healthy if you're not diabetic but if your sugars are everywhere if you have very high sugars you can not say that i can eat high gi foods every week mm-hmm. so it depends on where you're standing with how you see your metabolism so most of the time we should choose to eat low gi foods so it's nice to you know get an explanation for the things that we believe to be true like everyone knows that alcohol is bad for you smoking is bad for you i mean high glucose is bad for you like will make you age faster and after listening to this explanation how actually it does that it is more convincing to be you know be on that diet or to follow some rules yes. of food now that, okay so uh, we uh, yeah we got this that high uh, blood glucose are bad for you and uh, the thing that now i want to ask you is how to do it i mean uh, and in this context of the thing that people are going towards personalized things i mean uh, will will it not be great if i measure my blood glucose level on regular basis and then according to that i should maintain my diet to keep that blood glucose level in a particular concentration so uh, yeah. what do you think i think you have put an excellent question here personalized care is very important always what suits you may not suit me mm-hmm. and needs personalization when it comes to blood glucose monitoring in uh, past times we only used to check fasting blood glucose we used to sometimes uh, whenever needed we used to do something called oral glucose tolerance test so we stimulate the body and see if is able to use up glucose in a specific time if you can explain those terms so fasting blood glucose is the blood glucose you check when your body is for at least a minimum 8 hours of fasted state 
so that is where we ask them to do morning 7 am 8 am when they have fasted for at least 8 hours that is called fasting blood glucose and uh, gluc- oral glucose tolerance test is when at least 75 grams of oral glucose is directly given to them ask them to drink and after one hour and after two hours we check for their blood glucose there are certain variables under which if you fall you are a non-diabetic over which if you fall you are a diabetic that was a simple way of checking if you are a diabetic or not but there is more to it in recent studies a lot of things have come to play that even before you develop diabetes at least five to ten years before that your metabolism Metabolic dysfunction is the term when we use when, uh, when your body metabolism is not optimal. That means your body is not working 100% right mm. or it's not giving its 100%. Then we call it metabolic dysfunction. So even before you develop diabetes, your body is already in metabolic dysfunction for 10 to 5, or 5 to 10 years before that. So how to detect this metabolic dysfunction is one way is to look through continuous glucose monitoring or a CGM patches that people wear mm-hmm. on their arms. So how do we do it? There are two big variables we need to look at it. One is the term called glucose variability. That means whenever you eat and whenever you're not eating, uh, your baseline and your highest glucose level. How much is it varying? This is called glucose variability. If your body should work 100%, then your glucose variability should not be more than 30 mgDL. But in today's time, that is impossible. Uh, at least we have to maintain 50 mg real glucose variability at least but higher your glucose variability higher your oxidative stress uh, higher your metabolic dysfunction that means your meta- mitochondria is not work, uh, working to their 100 percent so higher your mitochondrial dysfunction higher your oxidative stress your longevity genes are not stimulated um, and your vascular endothelium your protective lining of your blood vessels is not doing its function well. That is one thing. So the way to go forward is to maintain as less glucose variability as possible. Maintain very few glucose spikes and roughs. So let me tell you when we eat a high GI food, for example, white rice with simple dal, white rice with simple curry. For most of the people, white rice spikes blood glucose. It depends inter-individually how much it spikes. But as soon as it spikes, it um, falls down again. So it, in the graph, it creates a trough. So in your lifetime, if you have more spikes and more troughs, that it means if you have high glucose variability, your risk for all the diseases is very high. And metabolic flexibility is lost. What is metabolic flexibility? Uh, when we are in a fasted state, body should use up our body fats for energy mm. or body should use ketones for energy production. When you are in feasted state, when you are when you are eating something, your body should use carbs for your energy. This is called metabolic flexibility or metabolic switch, which should happen very effectively otherwise. But when your glucose variability is very high, that means you are playing your body by giving a lot of high GI foods or eating high sugary foods, you're putting your body at risk. When you're eating high GI foods, body uses up more insulin to bring your blood glucose to normal. Mm. So you're putting your insulin at risk. You develop insulin resistance. That means body will no longer respond to insulin in a way it used to respond before. So what happens? Um, um, It will take long time to uh, stabilize your blood glucose. So blood glucose will be, will not be in the diabetic range and also will not be in the normal range. And it is using up more and more insulin because it is becoming immune resistance. So that is when we have high insulin levels. Before we never used to do insulin levels in the body, but now it's important even before we check. All of us, if we go through our testing, our FPS of fasting blood glucose may be normal, but it's stunning. We check that if you are in a metabolic dysfunction by doing two important tests which is fasting insulin and post meal insulin levels and by wearing a CGM to check how your glucose variability is. So these two things will let us know if we are in optimal health, if you are metabolically, if you are fit or not, if your energy production is optimal, are the substrates or the fuel used well. 
if you can compare insulin resistance to the um, age of the vehicle suppose if you have brought a vehicle its mileage is lot better when you get it but as it becomes older and older your mileage comes down right so so vehicle uses up more fuel right to uh, pushes so that means it is using more fuel same way we use up more insulin as we eat more and more high gi foods so we need to save our insulin well mm-hmm. that's the reason we have to make healthy choices when we are eating just don't overuse it don't overuse your fuel which is insulin and also drive your vehicle better if you are driving it but too fast also you're going to use up your fuel so that means don't eat don't be very sedentary as soon as you eat wake up um, after you eat uh, get up take a short walk uh, take a 10 to 15 minutes walk so that also will influence your post meal glucose levels you can bring it in meal now add more fiber to your diet that we also we can bring your uh, uh, spikes of glucose post meal so these are all the ways that we can now again i'm eating that seven color food salad okay in my lunch rainbow, rainbow food salad with and i enjoy that i thought salad will be nice not that tasty but it is but as we keep learning about what food does to our body mm-hmm. i think it. we'll enjoy eating that even i never enjoyed looking at salads me <laughs> gave me nausea but now i enjoy eating them because i know what these nutrients in the food yeah, are doing to our body it, it makes sense now we are just not uh, blindly following no, we know we, we know the science yes. then that makes it now another interesting thing is i find it very interesting that everyone's body react to food differently yes i mean for me for example uh, the uh, white rice will spike glucose level more than any other individual and there is this variation and one of that reason for that might be gut microbiome mm-hmm. and as a biotechnology student i find gut microbiome everything very very interesting mm-hmm. so can you explain this glucose levels relation with gut microbiome yes so here is the thing we have something called gip glp1 molecules in the gut mm-hmm. suppose when we eat food mm-hmm. body should release insulin so how is it triggered we have certain molecules in the gut like gastrointestinal peptide and a glp1 which will uh, trigger insulin to be released that is one way to look at it and even in the gut we have hundreds and thousands of bacteria and everywhere this is called diversity more bacteria you have more different kinds of bacteria you have better but again there is a difference in bacterium some have uh, uh bifidobacterium some have uh, fecalibacterium some have graminococcus all these things but when uh, the diversity was ob- observed uh people who had uh, these um, fusobacterium or rhamnococcus Uh, or even body up these bacterium had better influence on the body these individuals have low risk of diabetes again these are influenced by these bacteria in the gut are influenced by type of food you are giving to them these are probiotics so f- bacteria feeds on food called prebiotics hmm. which are high in fiber like all these vegetables fruits and all those things that you are eating so again stimulating these specific bacteria which will prevent us from diabetes or which will um, give us good blood glucose levels are these three bacteria i just men- mentioned fusobacterium rhamnococcus so the way to stimulate these bacteria is again through food mm-hmm. what we put into our stomach is what is important that is one way and stress is another important thing uh that also we need to look at it so yes having different kinds of bacteria in the gut can put us in different situations so yeah, prebiotic is the food for good good bacteria yes. probiotic is actually good probiotic bacteria. is actually a bacterium that you're giving externally okay so talking about supplements and everything this uh there is this metformin mm-hmm. drug mm-hmm. and i found that a uh, study very interesting that people who took metformin for treating diabetes their life span and health span is 
more, more. better mm-hmm. than the people who don't have diabetes. Yes. And uh, you know, some part of me uh, wants to avoid these supplements, wants to avoid these drugs uh, like metformin, and uh, stay healthy, like by eating natural foods and natural things. But at the same time. I also don't want to be ignorant because mm-hmm. this is the fact about metformin that you know mm-hmm. struck me like how mm-hmm. is like people having diabetes and taking metformin they are living longer and healthy mm-hmm. with respect to the people which don't have diabetes I mean that was the study so what is your take on this using supplements or metformin or any other like pre mm-hmm. pre or probiotics for healthy aging and longevity. I think it's always better to take a doctor's opinion whenever you start. Yeah. It could be a supplement, it could be an anti-aging molecule, the medic medications. So there's something interesting going on with the molecule metformin <coughs> since long time now. There are a lot of studies. I think um, initially metformin was used only for diabetes. Now we use for pre-diabetes. It has been also always used for PCOS. It has been used in some in most of the individuals with insulin resistance and. Um, even in pregnancy and even in obesity so protective benefits of metformin have been seen as an anti-aging molecule because it reduces oxidative stress it improves vascular endothelium it improves the it as i said whenever we have this ages or advanced glycation in parts it will damage your endothelium but metformin protects the endothelium vascular endothelium metformin improves insulin sensitivity so that is why we do not have much glucose variability where i talked about lot of adverse effects that we develop when we have high glucose variability so all these secondary things are prevented with metformin mm-hmm. so it is providing more antioxidant uh, benefit to the body it is providing uh, benefit to vascular endothelium it is uh, preventing many other diseases that can come as in a process of mechanisms that are avoided by metformin that is how metformin is helping and that is how i think people are living longer people are pushing all these diseases longer okay. but by saying that i don't i'm not saying i would recommend this metformin yeah. to everyone who wants to be <laughs> uh, aging healthy first we should do everything that we can do to age healthy exercise uh having anti stress methods or de stressing regularly having good social communications and um, taking good kind of diet as i said yeah uh, uh, people want more i mean uh, they are greedy i mean and i accept <laughs> that i am greedy and if something taking a pill is working then i i don't know i'm i'm i'm, I'm making my mind to it but sometimes people may make a mistake here that they take pill as a replacement to yeah. all these things like diet exercise stress and everything so that should not be the case if you if you're taking if you're doing all these if you're consulted to your doctor your doctor has advised something more to keep you in a better to make you a better version then go go ahead and take it but it is not a replacement hmm. to all of this so can that is add benefit maybe it can really. have a ba- added benefit again it has to be personalized with your doctor do you need it or do you not um now we carrying the adverse effects of metformin if you're taking it because it has got a lot of gastric hmm. issues so are you putting yourself in a trouble of lactic acidosis do you have any risk for lactic acidosis all the all these things need to be sorted out so only after doing all these work up maybe if your doctor is advising if you need it then maybe. What about all those other longevity molecules that are famous nowadays? NMN, resveratrol, and then spermidine. Okay. <clears throat> Again, the role of all these molecules are uh, to protect your DNA, to protect your telomeres, to give antioxidant benefits. Um, all these things. So it provides. If it is providing an added antioxidant benefit along with whatever you are doing, then do it. but if you're not doing anything properly if you're not following your diet your lifestyle is uh, in a um, uh, break and you're taking alcohol on daily basis you're <laughs> smoking you're doing everything and popping an antioxidant waiting to see its effect it's not going to work like that so it's not a um, balance it's not a very good balance 
uh, if you're doing everything right, then maybe talk to your doctor. And um, these have good benefits, but what time are you taking? When are you taking? How is your body when you're taking? Are you uh, are you in a good lifestyle when you're taking the molecule? All these matters for that molecules to act properly in your body. Yes. So, yeah. And don't take uh, longevity that pill with a glass of whiskey. I know. Mean, <laughs> that is true. That is true. People yeah. often do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's all questions I had, and it was very interesting to listen to you, Dr. Samathakulna. Oh, Especially yeah. high glucose mm-hmm. level and how those, uh, what happens at molecular and cellular level. Okay. Got to uh, new so many new things. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I think there are some insights that we all can take home today. Thank you. Thank you.